The unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia continues. Previously, we switched to producing videos describing 15-day periods of the war in Ukraine, when changes on the battlefield happened more often. But since the situation on the battlefield remained almost unchanged for more than a month due to the weather conditions, this time we decided to create a video on a month-long period of December 16th to January 16th. Battles on the Donbass front, particularly in and around the towns of Bakhmut and Solodar, remained the bloodiest, as the Russian forces finally managed a breakthrough. In this video we will talk about this breakthrough in Solodar, the situation on other fronts of the battlefield, and critical political, economic and diplomatic developments about the war in Ukraine. Even for those far from the war, its economic impact is still being felt every day. You're feeling it at the gas pump, with your grocery bill and in your paycheck. But worst of all, out of control inflation has depleted your savings accounts and wrecked many retirement plans. And if you think you can just recoup the loss in the stock market, think again. In 2022, it lost over 20% leading many people like you to realize that there must be a more stable way to invest. One place these investors have turned is an exclusive market with low correlation to stocks, which is opening to more people than ever due to the revolutionary approach of our sponsor, Masterworks. They specialize in the buying and selling of shares in art, a particularly stable market in the current climate. Even top investment bank Morgan Stanley recently noted, investment-grade art often experiences lower price volatility when every other market is suffering declines. Masterworks makes getting into art easy, allowing people to buy in without the usual massive entry costs. Their world-class art experts analyze their unique database of art auction results, buy pieces from the likes of Banksy and Basquiat, and then sell them at opportune moments to provide a return to investors. This approach has led to an impressive track record of 11 sales, each of them profitable. In just the last 60 days, their investors got 10%, 14% and 35% returns. Masterworks has over 627,000 members and an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. Demand is surging as more investors actively reallocate their assets, so there is a waitlist to get started, but you can click our link in the description to skip it right now. As usual. Let's start by examining the situation on the battlefield. The Hessan front remained unchanged, despite information about Ukrainian deployment to Potyomkinsky Island on January 2nd, ongoing battles in Kinburn Spit on the left bank of the Dnipro on January 8th, and the constant exchange of artillery fire across the river. Neither of the actions on the left bank of the Dnipro has been confirmed by any footage. So on the one hand, there are reports of action on this front but on the other hand, both sides have been redeploying their personnel from this front to more active fronts on the battlefield. The stalemate on the Zaporizhian front mostly continued amid reports of the deployment of troops from both sides to this area. The most notable development has been minor Ukrainian progress towards Doroshnyanka, but it does not look like a component of a larger offensive at this point. By now it has become an open secret that Ukraine is particularly planning offensive operations on this front, but this may have been delayed due to a deteriorating situation on the Donbass front, where Russia has finally achieved a minor breakthrough. The immense pressure the Russian army, Wagner mercenaries and separatist forces have been putting on this front for months has taken its toll on the defenders. The Ukrainian command needed to deploy some of the units it may have been preparing for an expected spring offensive declared by the Ukrainian military intelligence chief, Kirilo Budinov, to Donbass. Heavy battles in Bakhmut continued during this period, where the 71st Jäger Brigade, the 57th Motorized Brigade, and elements of the Ukrainian special forces largely withstood almost daily attacks by Wagner mercenaries. On several occasions, the Russians managed to enter the outskirts of Bakhmut before being pushed back by the Ukrainian army. The importance of the Bakhmut section of the battlefield prompted President Zelensky and Budinov to visit it in late December to boost the defenders' morale. Nevertheless, Russia achieved progress in this area for the first time in months. By the end of the year, Wagner made progress towards Yakovlivka, Kerjimivka, Klishivka, Pitorodna and Vodiana. Since progress inside Bakhmut has been repelled by Ukrainian defenders on numerous occasions, which was confirmed by Wagner's boss Yevgeny Prigozhin, 
Russia turned its focus onto the town north of Bakhmut, Solidar. On January 6th, Wagner groups and Russian airborne units broke through the defensive line manned by the 46th Airmobile Brigade and the 17th Tank Brigade in Solidar. This allowed Russia to capture Solidar by January 15th, as the Ukrainians retreated to fortified high ground west of the town. Russians also occupied Bakhmutska and advanced in Pithorodna, Krasnohora and Sil. The Russian movement indicates they intend to advance on another supply line to Bakhmut and complete the pincer movement on this town. The fall of Bakhmut is far from being a foregone conclusion and would not give Russia a strategic advantage. Still, it would be its first meaningful victory on the battlefield since the capture of Severodonetsk and Lysychansk in the summer of 2022. Russian pressure on this front has forced the Ukrainians to divert some of their forces to this area, with as many as 30,000 Ukrainian soldiers fighting in this direction against 50 to 60,000 Russians. Both sides suffered heavy losses in the battles of Solodar, Bakhmut and other sections of this front. According to the former Danish defense attaché to Ukraine, Klaus Mathieson, each side has lost more than 10,000 soldiers in the battle for Solidar. He does not specify whether this number reflects all casualties since the start of the Battle of Solidar, or perhaps all casualties in the Bakhmut Solidar section of the front. In any case, this is a huge number for such a small section of the battlefield, which seems to lack strategic significance. On the North Luhansk front, the Kremina Dibrova section has been the hottest. The Ukrainian 95th Air Assault Brigade has achieved notable progress, reportedly reaching Kremina. Liberation of Kremina would cut one of the Russian supply lines to Severodonetsk and put pressure on the Russian defensive line on this front from the south. Fighting has been ongoing throughout the entire front, but neither side has achieved a decisive breakthrough in this period. The worsening of the situation in Donbass is not the only factor which may hinder the Ukrainian attempts to prepare a strike force for its planned offensive. A possible attack on Kyiv and the northern border of Ukraine continues to worry the Ukrainian command. Putin met with Lukashenko in Minsk on December 19th, and the Belarusian president stated that Russia would deploy S-400 air defense systems and Iskander missile complexes to Belarus, and paid lip service to friendly relations with Russia. Still, he stopped way short of making any statements that may lead us to believe that Belarus is actually going to join Putin's Operation Z. But Russia continued to bring in more military assets to Belarus. For instance, on December 20th, some 30 Russian T-80 tanks were deployed to Belarus. The Belarusian government announced restrictions on entering three districts bordering Ukraine the following day. On December 27th, British intelligence reported that elements of the Russian First Guards tank army, significantly weakened after Ukraine's Izium counteroffensive, had been brought to Belarus. Earlier in December, the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, Valery Zaluzhny, stated that he was sure that the Russians would launch one more attack on Kyiv. However, at this stage, most Ukrainian authorities believe it is not likely. The military intelligence chief, Budinov, told the New York Times on December 24th that Russia is conducting a disinformation campaign with the movement of its forces to Belarus to persuade Ukraine to commit more units to its northern border. He claimed that Russian forces in Belarus were not in an offensive formation and the mobilized soldiers were sent to Donbass after their training. Budinov also argued that Russia does not have sufficient armored vehicles to plan an attack on Ukraine from Belarus. According to him, the Russians would send a train full of Russian soldiers to Belarus, close to the Ukrainian border, and wait for several hours before returning as part of their disinformation work. But Budinov still warned against complacency, as he indicated that an invasion from Belarus could not be ruled out. According to the chief of the Ukrainian border troops, Sergei Dineko, Russia had 10,000 soldiers in Belarus as of December 28th which is insufficient for a meaningful offensive campaign. On January 11th, Zelensky mirrored Budinov's statements on the unlikeliness of an imminent Russian attack from Belarus, but still emphasized the importance of preparing for any potential offensive from Ukraine's northwestern border. Ukraine's defense minister, Reznikov, also argued that a Russian offensive from Belarus does not look likely, 
as Russia lacks resources and needs more time to create a formidable strike force from that axis, and claimed that Russia's next offensive would probably come from the occupied Ukrainian lands. We will continue monitoring the situation in Belarus to understand whether Russia is actually planning another attack on Kyiv, or if it's just a feint to force Ukraine to commit units to the border with Belarus, instead of using them for deoccupation efforts in the south and east of the country. During this period, Ukraine made several deadly HIMARS strikes on Russian military assets, while Russia continued attacking the Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Russia attacked Ukrainian cities with Iranian drones, cruise missiles, and airstrikes on December 16th, 19th, 29th, 30th, 31st, and January 1st, 2nd, and 14th. The last of these attacks was particularly bloody, as at least 40 people were killed after a cruise missile hit a residential building in Dnipro. These strikes further damaged the energy infrastructure of Ukraine. Ukraine retaliated with several strikes of its own on Russian soil. On December 26th and 29th, Ukrainian UAVs attacked the Engels airfield in Saratov, launching several drone attacks on energy infrastructure of the Bryansk Oblast. But Ukraine's HIMARS strikes were particularly sensitive. On December 16th, the HIMARS strike on Lantarivka, Luhansk Oblast, killed dozens of Russian trench diggers, while another strike destroyed two ammunition depots in Zaporizhia Oblast, killing several Russian soldiers. The strike on December 31st garnered the most attention. It is reported that several hundred Russian mobilized soldiers were in their barracks in Makivka celebrating New Year's Eve and listening to the Dear Leader's speech when the HIMARS hit them. There were so many casualties that even the Russian MOD acknowledged 78 dead and 138 injured. But independent accounts talk about anywhere between 200 and 400 killed in this strike. On January 5th, Ukrainian sources reported about a strike on a Russian military base in Tokmak, which hosted military equipment and several hundred soldiers. These strikes have been so deadly due to the Russian command continuing to inexplicably host hundreds of soldiers together with ammunition depots within range of the HIMARS. The Russian Ministry of Defense tried to offset discontent in Russian society with these losses with a fabricated claim that a Russian strike on a Ukrainian army barracks in Kramatorsk killed 600 soldiers on January 8th. But journalists who visited the strike site reported that a Russian S-300 hit an empty school and there were no signs of any dead soldiers. This war has already proven time and time again that Western arms support to Ukraine is making a massive difference. Ukraine's allies have continued providing military, economic and humanitarian support to ensure that Ukraine can stand up to Russia and will continue to do so. The period we describe has been particularly noteworthy in terms of pledges. Western countries talked about supplying tanks, which they've been reluctant to do until now. On December 16th, the United States stated that it expanded its training program to 500 Ukrainian soldiers monthly. On December 28th, Spain pledged to train 2,400 Ukrainian soldiers in 2023. Earlier, other EU members made similar commitments, and some military experts believe that Ukrainian soldiers trained in Western countries will be used later during the Ukrainian army's counter-offensive operations. In this period, the United States made several significant pledges of weapon support to Ukraine. On December 16th, the US Senate passed the 2023 military budget, which included an additional $800 million of military assistance to Ukraine. The White House has also requested that Congress provide an additional $38 billion to assist Ukraine. President Zelensky's visit to the United States, which was his first foreign visit since the start of the war on December 20th, arguably played an important role in expediting American military support to Ukraine. Zelensky's speech in Congress was met with the almost universal approval of American representatives. His meeting with Biden was important in coordinating the future American support to Ukraine. On December 21st, the US announced another package of military aid to Ukraine worth $1.8 billion, which included JDAM precision-guided bombs, which we talked about in the previous video, HIMARS ammunition, AGM-88 harm missiles, artillery shells, ammunition, trucks, military vehicles, other types of assistance, and most importantly, the Patriot air defense battery. 
One battery includes four to eight launching pads with four air defense missiles in each. Patriot is effective against both cruise and ballistic missiles and will play an important role in Ukraine's air defense after training on this system's use is completed in 2023. On January 5th, the US announced another military aid package worth $3.75 billion, which included 50 Bradley fighting vehicles, 100 M113 armored personnel carriers, 55 MRAP vehicles, 138 HMMWVs, Sea Sparrow air defense rockets, Excalibur precision projectiles, 18 M109 self-propelled howitzers, HIMARS ammunition, and so on. Notably, the US government has not used Lend-Lease to provide military support to Ukraine. Instead, it uses the means of its federal budget to not add additional pressure on the Ukrainian economy. Other countries also made pledges and deliveries of weapons to Ukraine. On December 19th, 39 Canadian armoured combat support vehicles arrived in Ukraine. On December 23rd, the Dutch government pledged 2.5 billion euros for military and infrastructure assistance to Ukraine. On January 4th, French President Macron promised Zelensky to supply Ukraine with AMX-10 armoured fighting vehicles with large calibre tank guns. On December 5th, the German government pledged 40 Marder infantry fighting vehicles and a battery of Patriots to Ukraine. On the same day, Norway donated 10,000 artillery shells to Ukraine. On January 10th, it was reported that Pakistan would send 159 containers of 155mm artillery shells to Ukraine, while Canada pledged to provide another Nassam's air defense system. On January 11th, Polish President Duda announced that Poland would provide a company of Leopard tanks within the framework of a coalition effort. This was followed by a British pledge to send Challenger 2 tanks and increased pressure on Germany to supply Ukraine with Leopards. On January 13th, Italy announced its intention to give SAMPT air defense systems to Ukraine. On the same day, Poland gave 8,000 Starlink terminals to Ukraine while the Ukrainian Defense Ministry announced that it had allocated almost $500 million for the purchase of different types of UAVs. On January 16th, the UK announced that it will supply a squadron of Challenger 2 main battle tanks, 30 AS-90 self-propelled howitzers, and hundreds of armored vehicles, including Bulldog armored personnel carriers, to Ukraine. The most notable difference in weapon assistance to Ukraine in this period is that the West has finally started pledging Western-produced tanks to Ukraine and increasing the supply of armored vehicles. This arguably serves the purpose of creating necessary military conditions for a Ukrainian offensive. But Ukraine will need more to have a chance at a decisive strike in the foreseeable future. Nevertheless, as of January 16th, according to Bloomberg, Ukraine's allies have provided and pledged 410 tanks, 300 armored vehicles, 1,100 armored personnel carriers, 1,540 infantry mobility vehicles, 300 towed artillery units, more than 400 self-propelled artillery units, 38 HIMARS, more than 40 Soviet-produced MLRS, 17 Su-25 jets, 31 helicopters of Soviet production, 30 TB2 drones, hundreds of switchblades, 37 Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, 8 NASAMS batteries, 2 Patriot batteries, and so on. The difference this support has made so far for Ukraine cannot be understated. But according to Kirill Budinov, Ukraine is waiting for more modern weapons from its allies to break the stalemate. On January 20th, NATO members and other allies of Ukraine are planning another meeting at the Ramstein Air Base. Eyes are on this meeting, as they often led to weapon pledges in the past. In comparison, reports on weapon supplies to Russia were almost non-existent in this period. The US government's sole claim regarding this stated that Wagner has been purchasing artillery shells from North Korea. Pyongyang has denied this. There have not been any dramatic changes on the diplomatic front either. The European Union adopted the ninth sanctions package against Russia on December 16th. Reuters reported that the EU members have agreed on the price cap for Russian gas at 1,900 euros per thousand cubic meters. Arguably in response, on December 27th, Putin signed a decree banning the sale of Russian oil to countries that have agreed on price caps. But a few days later, Putin backed out on his earlier decree, 
and allowed unfriendly countries to pay in euros or dollars for gas, if this was a payment for an outstanding debt. So far, the European policy of decreasing dependence on Russian energy has worked to a certain extent, as Russia is struggling to maintain the same level of energy revenues. According to the Wall Street Journal, Russian oil exports transported via sea decreased by 22% in December 2022 compared to December 2021, as it will take time for Russia to establish a market for its energy exports in the East as profitable as it has been in Europe. Both sides continued making statements about possible peace negotiations in this period. The CIA chief, William Burns, told PBS on December 16th that he does not see any seriousness on the part of the Russians about a real negotiation. Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov's statement on December 27th confirmed this, as he insisted on recognizing the illegal annexation of Ukrainian territories as a precondition for talks. Putin reiterated this stance in a phone call with Turkish President Erdogan on December 5th. At this point, Ukraine is clearly counting on its army and Western support to liberate all of its territory and does not intend to bow down to Russian demands, while Putin does not want to budge from his position either. Putin announced a unilateral ceasefire dedicated to Orthodox Christmas for 36 hours on January 6th to 7th. Still, Ukraine rejected this proposal as they believed that Russia would use this opportunity to regroup. So at this stage, the sides are very far apart in their positions. But some believe that the sides will be forced to come to an agreement after understanding that neither of them will be able to achieve a breakthrough on the battlefield. According to former NATO general Hans Lothar Domruse, Ukraine and Russia will stop hostilities in the summer as the offensives of both sides will fail to change much on the ground. For now, Ukraine maintains its position of insisting on its territorial integrity. Much will depend on how the military situation develops in the first half of 2023. The comparison of armies conducted by Forbes is a good starting point for understanding the advantages of Ukraine and Russia. According to Forbes, the firepower advantage of Russia is diminishing due to a high degree of Russian losses, the inability of its industry to compensate for these losses, and the West's continued military support of Ukraine. Ukraine has an advantage in long-range artillery, 35 to 50 kilometers, largely thanks to HIMARS and other Western systems supplied to Ukraine. But Russia enjoys a dominating superiority in long-range missile systems, over 100 kilometers, as Ukraine officially does not have any weapons with this range. That is why Ukraine has been lobbying for ATA CMS missiles for several months. For now, Russia also has an advantage in short-range artillery too, which enabled the Russians to advance in the spring to summer of 2022. But according to the UK Ministry of Defence, Russia won't be able to sustain its level of use of short-range artillery necessary for large-scale offensives. CNN recently assessed that Russia had decreased the intensity of its artillery strikes by 75% in certain sections. A similar sentiment was echoed by Budinov, who said that Russia had decreased artillery strikes from 60,000 artillery shells per day to 20,000 shells per day. It is worth monitoring whether Russia actually has an artillery shell shortage at this point, but it is hard to believe this as short-range artillery shelling has long been the cornerstone of first Soviet and then Russian military doctrine, which is predicated on massing of artillery on sections they intend to advance on. Having said that, we can see the trend of increased reliance on infantry by the Russian army, especially on the Donbass front. It is noteworthy that signals show that Russia is planning to increase the number of its ground forces. On December 17th, a chief of a military conscription office in Moscow Oblast stated in a video, which he later deleted, that conscripts will serve for two years instead of 1.5 years, starting in the autumn of 2023. On December 21st, Putin agreed with Shoigu's proposal to increase the size of the Russian army to 1.5 million people. Earlier, Putin decreed to increase the size of the army to 1.15 million people, so evidently, Putin believes that the Russian army needs more men to have a chance of victory in Ukraine. There have also been numerous claims of a second mobilization in Russia, but this had not happened by January 16th. There have been changes in command of the Russian army too. 
On December 26th, Lieutenant General Evgeny Nikiforov became the new commander of the Russian Western Military District. On January 10th, the former Central Military District commander, Colonel General Alexander Lapin, dismissed for the disastrous Russian defeat in the Izium counteroffensive following a campaign of criticism, probably orchestrated by the Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin, became the chief of staff of the Russian ground forces. On January 11th, the chief of the general staff of the Russian army, Valery Gerasimov, assumed the position of the commander of the joint grouping of forces in Ukraine, replacing General Sergei Sorovkin in this position, who became a deputy commander. Gerasimov was in charge of the initial offensive on Ukraine on February 24th, in which Russia failed to reach its goals. Nothing suggests that he will be capable of changing the situation on the battlefield as an effective commander. We do not have information on the inner workings of the Kremlin and the Russian Ministry of Defense, but this shuffling seems like a continuation of the power struggle between the official Russian army and the Wagner chief Prigozhin. Prigozhin and his men have been vocally critical of the Russian army for a while now. They have taken center stage in the war from the Russian side since the loss of the Kharkiv Oblast, but it seems like the tide is turning in favor of the official authorities. Prigozhin's organization still lacks an official status. In fact, it is illegal to create and join private military companies in Russia. Even though the Russian government still allows Wagner to recruit inmates, and will likely ignore the illegal nature of the organization under Russian law, as long as it is useful in Ukraine and elsewhere for Russian foreign policy goals, Prigozhin is walking a fine line and may well be punished if he crosses this line. There has been an interesting development in connection with the Ukrainian army too. In late December, a draft law increasing the criminal liability of soldiers for disobeying orders from commanding officers was submitted to the Ukrainian parliament. It was supported by Zeluzhny, who stressed the importance of discipline in the army. This indicates that the Ukrainian army has at least some problems with discipline in some of its units, and the Ukrainian command intends to address this issue. Nevertheless, part of Ukrainian society is against this law, as thousands have joined a petition against it. The full-scale war between Russia and Ukraine is in its 11th month. The war has had a wide range of consequences, from thousands of deaths, widespread destruction and economic problems, to less publicized consequences, such as the looting of art from Ukraine by Russia, which international art experts assess as the most significant art heist since World War II. The most recent estimate of casualties in the Russian army has been suggested to be at least 60,000 killed and three times more injured by the French Admiral Herve Blejean. This means that Russia has essentially lost close to 250,000 people killed and wounded. Blejean claimed that the Ukrainian losses are smaller but are still significant. What about military equipment losses on both sides? According to the Oryx blog, the visually confirmed equipment losses for Russia as of January 16th are 1,614 tanks, 3,436 vehicles, 220 command posts and communication stations, 556 artillery pieces and vehicles, 166 multiple rocket launchers, 68 aircraft, 75 helicopters, and 161 drones. For Ukraine, these are 449 tanks, 1,255 vehicles, 8 command posts and communication stations, 215 artillery pieces and vehicles, 37 multiple rocket launchers, 56 aircraft, 29 helicopters, and 57 drones. Our series will continue in the coming weeks, so make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord and much more. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.